Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by Mr. Richard King to talk about drum collecting and drum shows. Richard, welcome to the podcast. Howdy. Yeah, so um, this is going to be cool. I love doing these episodes about um, collecting and collectors and drum shows and all that cool stuff and how they all work together. Um, you have an interesting kind of role in this world where you're uh, really you're kind of a high end dealer um, to a lot of uh, different people and and do all kinds of things. But before we get into talking about drum collecting and some of the history of it going back into the 80s and uh, drum shows and all that stuff, why don't you tell us about yourself a little bit? Well, I live in Maryland now, but I grew up in the New Jersey area, started out in Edison and then lived in uh, Irvington and then East Brunswick. And uh, that was the era of all these great music stores that were privately owned. This is pre uh, big, big box stores. And uh, we had Mascara's Music in Union, New Jersey, and we had uh, Lou Rose Music in uh, Edison, New Jersey, and we had Highway Music in Irving, uh, East Brunswick. And these were all really great music stores that had brand new Slingland, Gretsch, Rogers and whatever. I used to pedal my little bicycle to these stores because I didn't have a driver's license then. And I used to steal the little uh, drum catalogs wherever they had them lying around. <laughs> yeah. And they would chase me out of there. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the drums, they weren't vintage then. They were, they, were, they were still being actively built, you know, and you'd see these amazing brand new Ludwig, you know, and Rogers and, and Zickos and Fives, all these great companies, you know. Yeah. And, um, I bought my very first drum set. I saved up my paper out money and bought for $100 a used Zimgar drum set. <laughs> wow. This is a lot of money back then. You know? Yeah, really? Uh -huh. And it was a cool kit because it was in black diamond pearl and had the little round badges, just like on a Brooklyn Gretsch kit, you know? Yeah. And right away, I was taking it apart, putting new heads on it. And then I, I put a Roger Swivomatic Tom holder on there because the old rail concept was just flopping over. And I uh, just love working on drums. And I've always been an active drummer, still am. And I always worked on drums on the side for fun as a, as a passion, you know? Yeah. And uh, I still still do that today. Yeah. Those Japanese kits, it's so interesting how um, I, I think they're great because, I mean, you you could buy one as a kid. Mm -hmm. You could save up your money and buy one. And and it, it really, I mean, by design, it looks like the drums that you 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 can't afford as a kid it gives you that taste of of you know and they really they sound minus you know maybe the rails and stuff like the hardware could be a little better but they're really nice drums um and uh i always have a special place in my heart for those um me too but you have since then graduated from the uh japanese stencil kits and have really dealt with some of the finest drums in the world and hardware and uh memorabilia and all that good stuff um so Let's just kind of hear about your background, but also really the history of um, drum collecting and drum shows as we go. So uh, where does it all start? Okay. Well, uh, by 1984, uh, there was starting to be a little bit of a buzz, a little bit of chatter around the country about old drums. They didn't call them vintage then. And there was a small article in Modern Drummer on vintage drums and collecting that was written by Rick Van Horn. And uh, he talked briefly about Radio Kings and Gretsch's. And that was one of the first mentions of collecting vintage drums. And he had pictures of old uh, Ludwig and Ludwig bass drums with the uh, scenery on them and stuff. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, very interesting to see that. But I, I already had the bug at that time. And I started to work for a local music store here in uh, Annapolis, Maryland called Master Musicians. And at that time, they were just a kind of a, a regular, you know, guitar and amplifiers and PA drum uh, music store, you know. And uh, one day somebody showed up with a 1950s uh, Slingland Green Sparkle uh, drum set, three piece. And I was like, oh, wow, look at that vintage drums, you know, and I just uh, had that article still in my head from uh, from Modern Drummer. And uh, the owner of the store was a gentleman by the name of Jonas Aronson. And uh, and we started talking about vintage drums and how cool they were. And uh, and next thing you know, Jonas uh, decided to start. Uh, putting a little advertisement in the back of the Modern Drummer magazine, mm -hmm. just saying, you know, if you're interested in vintage drums, it was a little tiny little article or not even an article, but a little advertisement in the very back pages. You had to pay like $100 for that back then. Yeah. And uh, and people would start to call into the music store and say, hey, I'm kind of interested in looking at some drums. And within like, I would say within like in two or three years, it went from zero to like a, a hundred 
because people saw that little ad and started calling up saying, Hey, I got an old drum set I want to sell, or wow, or we got something we're looking for a, a Radio King or a Black Beauty, you know. And hmm. and that's when we start started hearing about all these things. Because I was very, very uneducated as far as the 1920s and 30s and 40s go. I was very well appraised with 60s and 70s stuff. Yeah. And so Master Musicians started doing a newsletter. We used to send a newsletter out all over the country, and that it got bigger incrementally over the years and months that we did that. And at that time, there was another uh, drum company called Vintage Drum Center with Ned Ingerman, and he started getting into the vintage drum business as well. And he started putting out a newsletter. Uh, But at that time, he was based in New York, and then he made the move over to Iowa, to Libertyville, Iowa. Hmm. He started his drum letter, and then several other people popped up. Bobby Chison with Jollity Drum Farm, and then there was Lee and Walhall, and a great guy started a company called Drummer's Tradition in, in San Francisco. Uh, and then you have people just popping up all over the place, little by little. Hmm. And by 1989 or 1990, there was quite a bit of interest. In, and that was when I started to hear from Rob Cook as well. I used to see uh, he used to call us and we used to do some horse trading back and forth. And right around 1990, a local gentleman by the, the name of Mike Cairo here in Bethesda, Maryland, uh, had the very first, I would say, official drum show in 1990, I believe it was. It might have been 89, but I'm pretty sure it was 1990, over in Bethesda, Maryland. And he had a drum, a little drum shop called the, the Drum the drum Cellar. And uh, he was the one that put the very first vintage drum show. And all the players were there at that show. You know, Rob Cook was there, Jack Lawton, uh, Master Musicians, of course, we were there. And a lot of the guys that, that you see nowadays at drum shows uh, were there uh, all those years ago, 30 plus years ago. Man really exciting. It is exciting. I mean, there's so much there, too, which uh, I, have, I have a bunch of questions. But the first one, though, is, is going on that drum show. I mean, I think everyone who goes to a drum show has kind of a different reason for going. So personally, when I go to one, it's usually to make for networking for the podcast. It's to find guests. That's my reason. And then also, I like to look at the drums. But um People go uh, to acquire drums for their, for their stores to stock mm-hmm. them. People yeah. go for um, uh, the love of just meeting and networking without having a podcast or a reason to do it. But but also mm-hmm. there's just these people who collect, who, who drums come in and they don't really go out. Mm-hmm. Early on in that first drum show in, in 90 or 89, what would you say was the main, you know, was it was it really, let's just see how this is going for a lot of people? Or what was the main reason people wanted to go at that point? Well, people came there to buy. A lot of collectors came there to buy and see and look around. Yeah. It was it was kind of a first, a first attempt by a lot of people on expanding their collections. Yeah. Now, prices, because you hear people like Terry Keating, like Bonzolium and stuff. A lot of people will talk about, you know you would get a Ludwig kit for like 150 bucks. I mean, things were Mm -hmm. so cheap because the market hadn't totally blown up and inflated. Uh, How did you see things with, with prices from that original, let's say 84 ish, 85 to 90 had things been steadily rising when you finally got to that first drum show? Just a little bit. They really hadn't changed a whole lot at that point. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Do you remember yourself? Did you, acquire anything cool back then or what what was your collection like in those days which i'm sure it's changed a lot and and your business has grown but what was your experience like there uh my initial uh foray into vintage drums was all about tricks on drums oh and my handle used to be king tricks on because i had over 100 tricks on drums in my collection wow and uh because i wanted to find something that was really hard to find that was difficult you know, because Ludwigs and Gretches, there's a lot of that stuff. I mean, there's some rare Gretches and rare Ludwigs, but Trixons in this country are extremely rare. And that, that even then until now, even th- uh, they're still very rare. Yeah. Know, very hard to find. I have wanted and been trying to do, uh, it's not like I work on it every single day, but to do a Trixon episode. But everyone mm-hmm. usually refers me to, I believe his name is Ingo. Yeah, Ingo. He's the master. And uh, he has said uh, this was I have probably haven't talked to him in, a, in about two years, but uh, he said, I don't know. He basically said, I don't know if my English is good enough. And I'm like, you know, thinking, let's try because <laughs> like, everyone else is kind of like he's got to do it like he's oh, yeah. the man to do it. 
I, yeah. and they don't want to do it. So it's so it, even the episode about Trixon is elusive <laughs> yeah. and hard. Maybe you're the guy for it. If, if you're if you're King Trixon, you know, um, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm retired from the King Trixon business. <laughs> <laughs> Did you find Trixons there? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. As soon as I put the word out that I want a Trixon, people started writing in saying, hey, I got this Trixon bongos. And I was always looking for parts because the big problem with Trixons is you get them missing parts or missing hoops or whatever. So I was always putting out feelers there for old music stores that were tricks on dealers. I said, Hey, you got any little tricks on screws or brackets in the back or drum mm-hmm. heads? And they're like, yeah, we got one or two, you know? Yeah. So I was very fortunate because there was still in 1990, a few music stores that were still, uh, were, were originally tricks on dealers back in the sixties that were still in business. So I was able to get a lot of parts from those guys. Interesting. So I, I amassed a large trips on collection of parts, stands, rims, drum heads, you name it. Yeah, because the drum heads um, mm-hmm. are not uh, for for the particular. Is is it the speed? It's the Speedfire kit, right? That has the yeah, the, the Speedfire. Yeah, that's you know you don't go to Guitar Center and buy one of those bass drums. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> all right, so let's move forward here with with drum collecting because things really blew up, and uh, mm-hmm. nowadays stuff is astronomically expensive for some drum sets. So so where where did it go from there? Well, to be perfectly honest with you, the the drum collecting business has never been hugely popular or profitable as the guitar collecting business. Mm. You know, the guitar collecting business started back in the 70s and 80s, roughly on the same level as drums. But then sometime in the 80s, it just went to stratospheric levels. The prices went up and they'd never come down. You know, it's very different for drums. Our drums have incrementally gone up in value, but you can still buy like a good, nice vintage kit for about $1,500, you know what I mean? You can't do that with a guitar, you know, like a Strat. Yeah. Why is that? I mean, if you had to guess, why is it? Because when I worked at Guitar Center, even, I, I remember that, like, you know, the guys in, you know, I worked there for a summer, but like the guys in the guitar department were selling five guitars a day. Right. I worked there for four or five or six months and I didn't sell a single drum set. It, <laughs> I would say it's also, it's space. They're big. They're, you know, there's not as, maybe everyone besides, you know, ultra collectors, they don't have a lot of space. I mean, what, what do you think? Yeah. Well, first of all, there's a lot less drummers than there are guitar players. The guitar players outnumber us like a hundred or a thousand to one. You know what I mean? Yeah. And and you're right. They're, they give the drums take up a lot more space. Uh, they're low. They're noisier, and uh, so a lot of mom and pops they don't want their kids playing drums. They're like, why don't you play flute, you know, or acoustic guitar? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> don't play the drums. Yeah, no drums. <laughs> I was very fortunate because my mother was very supportive of my drum playing, and she wanted me to play at home as much as possible. So I got to practice every day in my basement. Yeah. Well, the flip side of that is that uh, if you have a drummer or a guitar player that really wants to play, they're going to play no matter what. Yeah. That's the way I was. I was going to play no matter what, you know? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So prices are, you know, like you said, they're main- maintaining. Uh, we, we haven't really got to that boom. So after the drum show in 90, the first one uh, in Maryland, right? Um, yes. What What happened after that? Well, they only had two shows in Bethesda, uh, the 90 and the 91, and that was it. And Mike was done. Uh, and then uh, Rob Cook uh, grabbed the football and ran with it, and he started his first drum show at, um, I think they had their first drum show at Cook's Music, which is in Alma, Michigan. And then they moved it over to where um, the uh, the famous music store that was in uh, in Chicago, uh, what was that called? Uh, Maury Lishon's shop. But uh, they moved it to there, to that location. I think it was called Frank's Drum Shop, maybe. I lose track. They, they, uh, Rob Cook ran with that. And then also right around the same time that Rob Cook ran with the drum show idea, my good friend Jack Lawton over here in Pennsylvania started his first show uh, in uh, Sellins Grove, uh, Pennsylvania, and started the uh, Pennsylvania Vintage Drum Show. So those guys were kind of neck and neck starting around the same time, you know. Mm. And, uh, and those grew very quickly. The Rob Cook drum show was very, very small, one room, and it blew up, and, and so did Jack's drum show. Yeah. Rob's been on the show, I think, more than anyone else, over 150 mm-hmm. episodes. He's been on about five times, and he's talked mm-hmm. a lot about the Chicago show. But, um, I mean, you're not doing these drum shows to like be stuffing cash in your pockets. I mean, right. it's really a, a labor of love, and I think it's um, it's it's awesome they do it. Um, and and for people, we I mean, every time we talk about shows, I always say it's just like you got to go. You got to experience it at least mm-hmm. once because it's so and, and you got to put yourself out there. And I've learned, too, that it's very much like each year you get more and more 
friendly with people and you, you recognize people. And I know, um, a lot of guys of your generation are, I mean, everyone, it, it all seems like they're friends and they're connected and they've, they've grown and they've, they've experienced this stuff together and they've bought and sold and traded. Um, so it's really cool. It's, it's such yeah. a cool experience. To expand on that, when I first started going to the Chicago show in the 90s, I only went there to, to socialize, basically. I would fly out there, rent a car, and I would hang around for the weekend and just just watch everybody and talk to people. And it was a great opportunity to meet with people that I'd talked with on the telephone for years and years at Master Musicians before there was the internet, you know. Yeah. And uh, it was a great opportunity to get together and meet with people and hang out and uh and then after a couple of years, I was like, wow, you know, there's some really good prices here. I might have to start buying. So then I started driving out there. Now I drive out there. Yeah. I mean, that's uh, it's funny to see people's cars when they're when they're <laughs> either con- when they're leaving with just absolutely stuffed with with drums. And um, that's an interesting thing, too, is you, you know, you you get the deals um, in the part. There's deals in the parking lot. There's like mm-hmm. meeting with people, you know, on the side. There's the 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 Sunday at five, every, like, I don't want to take this home kind of deals that you get, um, right. which, uh, is, is interesting. There's a lot of tactics. Um, yeah. but you have, as I referred in the, in the Lewis Bernstein episode, which, um, you know, people can go check out Lewis basically downsized his collection and you helped with that. You made yeah. this into a business. So, so as we're talking about this, when did that come into play with you realizing that, um, like you said, hey, there's some good deals here, but but mm-hmm. you help other people facilitate these deals. When when did that start to happen? Well, what happened is while I was working at Master Musicians, uh, we did everything through the store. We did consignments, we did purchases, and all that stuff was handled through the store. Uh, Master Musicians went out of business in 2002 because we had three uh, Mars gu- uh, guitar centers there uh, and the guitar center itself moved into the area, so that kind of forced that business to go out of out of uh, control. So we can no longer maintain that. So what happened is, um, at 2002, uh, I was, I was in, I had a dilemma because I didn't really know what I was going to do. I was still working full time in the band and working at the music store. So when the music store closed up, I was like, I don't know what the heck I'm going to do. But the, the one thing that was really cool was back in about 1998, we started doing eBay at master musicians and I learned how to work. I did basically made all my mistakes on eBay at the store. So in 2002, I started my own business on eBay called King's Music. And I went around and I started to do everything I was doing at the store only privately. Uh, but it was really hard because I had a very limited budget. I didn't have a ton of money, you know? Yeah. And uh, so I, I started kind of splitting my uh, part of it being purchasing. And part of my business was, was uh, selling stuff on consignment. I would sell all kinds of drums for, for other collectors that were thinning out their collections. And I've, I've done it. I've done that a number of times, you know, mm. so that kind of worked out in my favor. But what happened also on eBay is that um, I made good money with the drums and I, I turned over a lot of stuff. But more and more, I found that the hardware, the stands, the lugs, the bits was way more profitable because you could buy that at a much lower price. And I, I was able to turn that over. And I, and I kept looking back at the numbers. I'd, I'd look at the drums and I was like, oh, we made this money on the drums. I'd look at all the money we made on the hardware. Holy crap. <laughs> and so my specialty became hardware. And that's when I really started focusing on buying hardware. So if you, a lot of guys would see me at the drum show and my car would just be packed full of hardware. Like you said, driving back down uh, I-90 back to Maryland and my, my uh, Honda Pilot would just be loaded down in the back, you know, with, <laughs> to the roof with hardware, you yeah, know. <laughs> an extra thousand pounds of uh, hardware. <laughs> that poor car. Someone's got to do it. You know what I mean? Like, I like how there's these specialized. Mm-hmm. Y- y- you sound like, I mean, going from tricks on to hardware, y- you realize that um, it is a business and that you need to kind of pick your. Um, I'm sure you'd still buy a good deal, you know, drum set and, and sell it or whatever. But yeah. Um, it's just like hardware is small. It's, it's, it's lower. So you can mm-hmm. sell a lot more of it. You can sell a lot more, um, lugs than you can $1,500 vintage drum sets or something like that. Yeah. Um, now I don't want, you don't have to give away your secrets or anything, mm-hmm. but where would you be in those days? And, and whenever now, wh- where do you acquire this stuff? Are you hunting for it a lot or do people bring it to you? A lot. I don't really have to hunt it a whole lot because a lot of people know me for this. Mm-hmm. So I get a lot of calls from collectors and dealers 
who are not necessarily liquidating their collection of drums, but in buying all these drums, they ended up with boxes and boxes of hardware. And they'll yeah. say, Rich, you got to come here and clean me out. And I got way too much hardware. And so I would drive to Michigan or Pennsylvania or Maine or whatever and load my car up with a ton of hardware. And a lot of it just came by referral, by, by uh, word of mouth. I didn't really have to go looking. Yeah. And I, I really like how you said, too, that you you um, learned, you know, when you were at Master Musicians, right? That's the name. Yeah. The process of eBay and all this stuff, because it's not easy to do this. It's not this stuff no. takes time. And it, I've recently been um, I always have non drum related like reference, like uh, <laughs> parallel things that happen. But I've been doing uh, Facebook advertising and Google ads for a guy I shoot video for for psychology seminars. Mm. man, I mean, these Facebook ads and Google ads, it's kind of complicated and you really have to learn it. But when someone else is paying for it and you're on their, the clock with them, mm -hmm. it really takes a load off. And, and it's kind of like, all right, I'm working right now, but I'm learning keywords and things. So it, it's yeah. eBay and all this stuff. It's not mm -hmm. just snap a picture, put it up. Mm -hmm. You need a nice, clean description. You need photos. I mean, mm -hmm. all this stuff. So the fact that you could learn and make that work I think was very advantageous of you to, to use that time to make yeah. a business out of it for yourself. I was very fortunate because I was able to look over the shoulder of the webmaster at the store as he did the eBay and I would watch what he did and emulated it and learn how to do it on my own, you know, because if somebody just said, you know, here, go and do eBay and figure it out on my own, it, I would have been years <laughs> yeah. trying to figure that out. But by being able to watch the other guy and saw how he did it, it really helped speed things up. Yeah. I mean, because what, what you see when you go to someone's page, there's a lot on the back end. I've learned too, there's like there's like the whole storefront. I mean, if you're treating it like a business, you really need, I mean, your reviews matter. And then you're, you're, you've got it. You're like a shipping and handling department as well. I mean, you're all yeah. this stuff, which we'll talk about that. But um, do you think eBay is now as prominent as it was then? Because there's now Craigslist and Facebook and all these things. Do people use eBay just as much? Well, eBay, the one thing that's eBay uh, that has that is unique is their auctions, seven day live auctions. And I still use those from time to time. That's basically where I'll start something at 99 cents with no reserve and just let it roll. You don't really have that with Marketplace or with no. Reverb uh, or Craigslist for that matter. You buy whatever the price is or you negotiate it, but there's, there's no bidding, you know, and that's people still like the bid. It's still a horse race. You know, it's still like kind of like gambling with dice. Yeah, uh, and that's why when I put it up, I I started at ninety nine cents and just you know roll the dice and psh, let it go, you know. Yeah. Sometimes it pays and sometimes it doesn't. I was gonna say you have to have been I don't want to say burned, but sometimes if stuff doesn't go, I, I'm sure you have that feeling of like, you know, I wish I yes. could un undo that. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what you got into something, you know what you paid for it, and then you end up selling it for like a lot less than what you paid for, you know, but I always keep reminding myself, it's a game of numbers. At the end of the year, if you look at what you bought versus what you made, it always works out up in the plus category. So you can't look at the individual auction, go, Oh, and kill yourself. Oh yeah. That, you know? Yeah. yeah. Are you a numbers guy? Like, are you good with like, f I don't want to say good with finances. Cause that's sort of different of like, Oh, I'm, you know, I'm good at budgeting, but are you good at like bookkeeping for your own business and stuff? Was that always something you were good at? Or did you have to teach yourself that? Uh, I had a lot of help from an accountant. Okay. I take all my taxes and all my, my uh, Schedule C uh, you know, uh, deductions to an accountant, and she helps me, and she guides me on what I can do and what I can't do illegally. But I've, I've always used their help because on my own, I'd be screwed. Oh, yeah. As you go, though, are you, are you keeping track of like, like in an Excel a spreadsheet or something like, all right, this sold for $20? Are you keeping track of everything, or does eBay have a nice like, back end mm -hmm. that... In no, the, I don't write that. I, I, mean, I keep a printout of every auction. I can go back and okay. review, but I basically keep a running number in the back of my head on what sells, what doesn't sell, how much this sells against that. Got it. And when I go into a music store or I go to look at a collection of hardware, uh, I look at everything as a dollar amount. You know, how much was this one screw? How much can I get for it? Because a lot of times the, the hardware that you buy, that I buy, doesn't have a name on it. It's just a piece of hardware. Yeah. You got to know what you're looking at. Yeah. And you're looking at a box with a thousand bits and pieces in it. You got to be able to pick out what's going to make you money. And that's something that I've gotten pretty good at because I've had so much practice. I've been doing it for so long now. And I've, I have all the catalogs and the parts lists and the, and the 
parts indexes and stuff like that that have really been helpful. Because there's sometimes where I'll find something and I'll be like, what the heck is this? <laughs> And I'll be able to go back in like some old 1920s Levy catalog. And it's like, oh, it's that flip of the you know? Wow. <laughs> so yeah. interesting. So so if people listening um, are looking for a 1920s flibbity bib <laughs> what, I mean, would they come to you? And was that a good route for people to say, hey, I need this? Yeah, that's worked out real well. Because over the years, I've had some people that were looking for very specific things, you know, for uh, for restorations where they were trying to do redo a restore a, a vaudeville drum set, or I actually did some work for the movies where they wanted specific drums for a specific time era. So, uh, or I've done stuff for uh, celebrities as well. I've worked with a lot of celebrity drummers that were looking for very, very specific things. And that's something I was able to refine and uh, get, get pretty good at, you know? Okay. Wow. Yeah. That's cool. We'll circle back to celebrities and movies because everyone that's always cool stuff. So we got to talk yeah. about that more. This episode is brought to you by dream symbols. Dream Symbols has a masterclass with the legendary Paul Wertico coming up on Friday, April 15th at 5.30 p.m. at Stiebel Drums in Cleveland, Ohio. I'm sure it's going to be awesome, so if you are in or around the great state of Ohio near Cleveland on Friday, April 15th, go check out Paul Wertico's masterclass at 5.30 p.m. at Stiebel Drums. So do you have, like, in your house, like a, uh, I mean not a warehouse obviously, but like, but you, you keep all these, these parts are, are stocked and ready to go and, mm -hmm. and, and categorized. Yeah. I have the house I live in has a full basement and downstairs I have, uh, these racks and there's uh, parts containers, plastic parts stubs, and each one's labeled with what's in there, what brand it is and, and all that kind of stuff. And I can instantly, somebody says, I need a throw off lever for a three point strainer on a radio king. I know exactly where it's at. You know? Wow. So awesome. they need a tension rod or a rim. I have thousands of rims here, hoops of all sizes and shapes and colors, hmm. <laughs> you know? Wow. So yeah, I'm able to put my hands on all of that. And do you clean and process things when you find something that's all gunked up and dirty uh, to make it nice and ready to sell? Yeah, because uh, my feeling, my goal is I, I, I love knowing that when somebody pulls a piece of hardware out of a box that I ship to them, like a hi-hat stand, they can actually play it. Yeah. And it's going to play really good and it's going to be cleaned up. It's going to have nice rubber tips on it and the felts and all that stuff. A lot of times when you buy hardware on eBay or Facebook or Reverb, it's in pieces and it's missing parts and some parts are stripped out. I've gone through and made sure I've retapped and dyed all the screws to make sure everything you can actually tighten it up and the thing doesn't slip on you. Oh, you wow. Know, so, yeah. Wow, that's neat. Um, mm -hmm. Now let's circle back a little bit because, uh, like, when we're friends on Facebook, obviously, which you know, to to set this up and all this stuff, you post some really cool stuff that you like acquire that are like gold records from like the Carpenters and things like yeah. that. And I'm sure because so you're in that specialized um, world beyond drums, beyond hardware. Mm -hmm. um, how did that happen? Um, well, over the years, every once in a while, somebody would say, hey, you do eBay. I'm like, yeah. And they, they're like, I've got this such and such I want to sell, you know. And I, my attitude about it is like, well, if it's a little 25 cent trick, you know, we don't want to do it. But if you've got something of value that we both can make a lot of money on, I'd be more than happy to sell it. Like with uh, with Lewis uh, Bernstein, not only did he have the drums, but he had a bunch of original Buddy Rich memorabilia, drum cases and music stands and all kinds of cool stuff. Hmm. So we sold all that stuff on eBay as well. Uh, recently, I, I was working for somebody. Um, I'm still working for them. They called me up and said, I got a Ludwig drum set that was bought by this guy. He passed away recently. Can you sell it for us? And on a consignment, sure, no problem. And uh, we sold the drum set and it all worked out. I paid them and they were real happy with the result. And they were like, you know, we got all this, this memorabilia at the house. Would you be interested in selling that? I'm like, sure, why not? So I went over there and they started pulling all this like gold records out. I was like, holy crap, this is incredible. <laughs> you know, and uh, and uh, there's more to be had. There's tons more at this place. So wow. really excited to see what comes out of there. That is neat. Um, yeah. Have you had like an experience where you go, that was the coolest thing I've ever sold, drum related mm. or not drum related. But like, I mean, what was in, in, you know, I'm putting you on the spot, but what was like the coolest thing that you've ever sold so far? I think one of the coolest things I've ever sold I have right now in my possession uh, down in the basement. Uh, I was at a drum pick yesterday and I was, I was picking up some drums and cymbals and stuff. And the guy had a little suitcase. And I said, what's in that suitcase? It was an Acme whistle set. 
from the vaudeville era. And it came in a form fitted case back then that was nice made out of wood. It's not like some plastic case. This is probably about a 60 year old piece of equipment. And in that case was like about 20 uh, bird whistles. And wow. it's the coolest thing. It's lined in velvet and has all these beautiful uh, uh, whistles of every kind, man. It's freaking cool. That's and, awesome. Yeah. That, but that raises the question too of like, like that's sort of something that might not, you might have to find the right buyer. That mm -hmm. might not be the most, to me, that's worth a million dollars, but that might <laughs> not be the most valuable thing to no. Joe Schmo on the street because it's so specialized, but the history yeah. of it, that's kind of tough where, I mean, you got to find the right buyer for this stuff. You know, I mean, yes. that's very cool. I've already got that sold. It's going into a museum. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. That's perfect. I mean, that's yeah. could It couldn't be any better than that. I mean, that is that yeah. is definitely a part of history. They don't make them like they used to, you know, with know. All, <laughs> all that stuff. OK, so you mentioned um, working on uh, movies and stuff, which mm -hmm. which I, I'm assuming you're talking about, like supplying drums that would be in a period specific movie mm -hmm. and stuff like that. What are some of the movies you helped on? The biggest movie we ever worked on, this is when I was still at Master Musicians in the uh, late 1980s. There was a movie called uh, For the Boys with Bette Midler. Hmm. Uh, and they wanted six vintage drum sets for that. So we had to put this together quickly, you know, and uh, uh, they were looking for period specific, 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, and so on, you know. So we had to put a kit together for every era. And it was a big order. And uh, they wanted to buy them. They said, well, we can either buy them or we can rent them and we'll ship them back to you. I should have bought, I should have gotten them back, but we <laughs> sold them, you know. Wow. <laughs> and that was back when the drums were not bringing a whole lot of money. So I think the whole order was about $6,000 or $6,500 for the whole kit. Wow. You know, in Caboodle. And they, they charged the shipping to their, their handling company. So, but that was a really big deal. It's probably the biggest movie deal I've ever done, worked on. I've, I've done some smaller things since then. Um, I can't think of them right off the bat. I, I do a lot more work with celebrities is what I've really been working on. Yeah. I'm not working on, but it's not something I actively pursue. It kind of just works out that way. Yeah. I mean, if you have the means to have someone uh, put things together for you, like a, on a celebrity um, status, why not? Yeah. I mean, just say, hey, I want this this kind of drum set. Can you name either any celebrities you've worked with or, and if not, maybe what you know, celebrity X has what, what they typically buy. As far as celebrity drummers go, probably the biggest celebrity I've worked for is, uh, is for Charlie Watts. Oh, great. Yeah. 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 That was a huge deal. And I, I did a lot of work for Charlie over the years. Mm. I have yeah. a whole separate episode on YouTube, YouTube about that as well. Actually two episodes. I don't have it. It's, it was done when, with, uh, with a uh, John to Christopher. It's on his uh, website and he did a wonderful job of putting that together. So yeah, we have all that. Yeah, uh, John has done such a cool job of mm. uh, keeping Charlie. Not that anyone's forgetting Charlie Watts, but just keeping mm -hmm. him in, you know, in the, like in everyone's mind and all that stuff. And yeah. I got to meet him um, at a Stone show in New Orleans, and and just what a very there are very few drummers who have the means to buy those drums and mm. also be so passionate about it. Um, it. It's just unbelievable. I remember him talking about. He told me that he had, I believe, it was like Sonny Greer's drum set. Yes. Was that you? No, that's Steve uh, Maxwell. Okay, that's okay. It. Well, yeah. I'm sure. I mean, you guys are. There's, there's a couple. You know, I'm sure you guys are. Uh, you're obviously in the same business doing some of that yeah. stuff. But um, it doesn't get much cooler than providing drums for one of the biggest rock stars in the world. Yeah, you know what's interesting about that also is for many years that I worked for Charlie, he was just not interested in buying vintage drums just to buy vintage drums for collecting purposes. Any drum that he bought from me for a long time was for specifically for a particular application. He bought a drum set for me for the Rolling Stones, the big stage. And then he bought a drum set for me for the jazz band that he played in, you know, so that was, uh, they were very specific. And again, they were never bought at that time to collect. It was all to actually use them. Wow. Yeah. Wow. It wasn't until much later, like in the later nineties, uh, maybe even the early two thousands that he actually started collecting and putting the word out there, you know? Yeah. So I changed. I mean, people have, they're specific, you know, from from the beginner collector up to Charlie Watts. Um, they have their specific. Uh, I'm not going to be collecting. I'm going to actually use this versus I'm going to have a warehouse full of uh, <laughs> artifacts and 
and uh, very, very collectible items, which, man, I hope Don McCauley can get that music, like a museum put together with Charlie's uh, or whoever can get it put together with Charlie's amazing collection someday. That that would be cool. So uh, going back to the movie thing real quick, it's so neat that um, like the attention to detail on that movie to have these period correct drums, Mm -hmm. because really, I mean, then you got to think there's probably period correct, um, you know, pianos and everything in the music sequences. Six different drum sets. That's amazing that they had that level of of detail. Yeah, the property master was the guy that was setting this all up and their, their attention to detail is very important and relevant to the movie that they're making. And they're paid a lot of money to be exacting in their detail. Yeah. And the gentleman that was, um, that was doing that was a gentleman. I, I believe his name was Lewis Fleming was the name of the property master for that show. And he'd been around forever. He's, he was a, a old time Hollywood, uh, prop master. Yeah. You know, and he had a lot of experience in doing that. So, cause I've looked, I looked him up on the, on Wikipedia or something like that. And there he was He'd done all kinds of movies, quite yeah. a list. I don't know if he's still with us anymore. Interesting. That's a that's a neat job. I, I the studio I work at, we, uh, there was a movie that got filmed there that was called Girl from Compton. It was when the um, Straight Out of Compton, you know, movies movie was coming out, and it was about uh, Dr. Dre's ex wife or girlfriend, Michelle, and uh, they would come in and convert things and have period correct TVs and stuff. But I mean, they didn't really. Like we had a we have a giant MCI board that's kind of been the middle parts taken out and an an an, an Avid like a Pro Tools kind of rig is put in uh, a mm-hmm. C twenty four for people audio nerds listening but um that didn't go that much farther than that because it was like a lifetime or a Hallmark movie because yeah. it's time and attention and and yeah. and it really adds up so for the level of production for like a big Bette Midler movie in that era was would would make sense but um. Gosh, you wonder what happened to those drums after they got Maybe it went to his warehouse and they used it in later movies, you know? Yeah, I'm a big movie buff. So every time I go to California, I go to all the different, you know, Universal lot, the Warner Brothers lot. And I've been through their property uh, storage areas, which are massive. If you ever saw the end of the Raiders of the Lost Ark, there's a scene where they're going through this massive warehouse. It's like that. It's wow. huge, man. Wow. They got everything. You know... After all that work, though, I was just watching a movie. Uh, I'd never seen Arthur, and I just watched Arthur the other night, which yeah. classic movie. But there was a scene where he's walking into a, um, you know, or stumbling, I should say, into a, <laughs> a, a restaurant, and the drummer was like playing, but it was the most ridiculous. <laughs> like he was like keeping time, like riding on his tom. And then just like not synced up at all. So after all this hard work of like matching stuff up, it kind of comes down to the 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 background actor drummer, <laughs> which sometimes you look and you go, you're not even halfway yeah. <laughs> <laughs> resembling something real. Did you uh, when you watched the movie, were you like, you know, were you happy with the performance of the the, the drummer? Yeah, I was really happy because I, I, right around the same time, maybe a few years earlier, Gary Bussey had done a movie called The Buddy Holly Story. And it, it'll drive you crazy as a drummer because Buddy Holly takes place in the late 50s, early 60s. And here's a drummer playing a kit that's flagrantly from the 70s with the 70s Ludwig logo on it and all the hardware. I'm like, no, but <laughs> only us drummers would know that the regular person on the street would be, oh, it's a drummer playing a yeah. drum set, whatever. Yeah. I mean, there's like, I'm sure there are uh, websites devoted to these, like, you know, um, mistakes in movies where like, you know, you're watching a 19. 19- 50s oh, yeah. movie and there's like a honda accord in the back or something like that or a microphone um, hanging down you know <laughs> well um microphones are interesting you know i always heard um that the howard stern movie private parts was extremely detailed with the microphone choices of uh-huh. each microphone through the period of like you know his dad working at the radio station which that's a great movie um but now, all right, so let's talk a little bit about how things have changed with collecting as far as uh, then to now uh, with the prices. I mean, things have really, really gotten a lot uh, more expensive. You're in the hardware business specifically, but obviously I'm sure you still do the drums and stuff. Yeah. Um, has it slowed things down where people are buying less because the prices have gotten higher, you think? Mm. If you have a good quality kit that hasn't been mucked around with and it's nice and original, you'll always be able to sell it. You know, there's a lot of kits out there that over the years that people have drilled extra holes and modified, you know, 
but the, the rare pieces seem to command more and more money nowadays. You know, the really rare stuff like the Gretsch Gladstones, the Black Beauties have always remained consistent. Uh, we used to think Black Beauties were like maybe only 10 ever made. Now we've come to find out that they made hundreds of them. Mm -hmm. And we just to think that Radio Kings were exquisitely rare. And now we've seen that they, you know, because of Gene Krupa, they made hundreds of those too. I run yeah. into them all the time. But it's the really rare pieces, you know, like the little Gretsch 4x14 uh, bebop snare drums, the Cadillac green kits, the Camco kits have really gone up in value. Yeah. And Camco kits really command thousands of dollars. You know? So yeah, it's interesting to see that. Yeah, things go up and down. Uh, but Camco, I mean, I guess it's really a, a matter of uh, supply and demand. And if there's yeah. less supply, then demand goes through the roof. Yeah. Do you have a drum set where like it could be Camco or like, a you know, the Gretsch Gladstones or a Gladstone where it's really kind of, again, holy grail moments? What would be some one that comes to mind that's just like <sighs> like drum set wise that yeah. was a an absolute mega, you know, uh, find and or or consignment deal? Mm -hmm. I think the Ludwig Citrus mod is probably one of the rarest things I've come across. Uh, a guy here in Maryland a number of years ago had a Citrus mod kit and he called me up. And he says, I got to I need this sell my kit i've got some financial trouble i'm like what is it he says oh it's a ludwig citrus mod you know i'm like oh boy hmm. so I, I i didn't even have it yet I, I had a photograph of it that he sent to me uh, on the, i guess on the text or something and i sent that to bunny carlos and bunny was like i'll take it <laughs> so like a month later i was going to the chicago drum show i brought it with me that way he didn't have to pay for shipping that's smart which very cool man shipping is uh, a whole mm. thing i mean in, in your world, especially, I mean, um, well, I guess parts, parts are smart. You're smart on many levels with the, the parts thing, because that's a little <laughs> easier to ship. But yep. I mean, you got to I think everyone's had that where drums or not drums or whatever, mm -hmm. anything that you ship where you it's kind of hard to calculate shipping. I'm sure you figure it out how mm -hmm. to really do it. But what are some tips you have from for people on, on how to ship correctly and not get burned with prices? Um, I try to use post office whenever I can, because post office can be really competitive com when it comes to small parts or a small drum that's very light, you know, yeah. uh, I generally otherwise use FedEx ground otherwise for everything, uh, unless I'm shipping internationally, then I got to go through the post office. I've had a lot of experience shipping internationally over the years, and, uh, I've learned how to, I've done pretty well with shipping. I've, I, I haven't damaged or had anything broken in my, as a result of my shipping uh, progress or prowess in probably 30 years. Wow. You know, I'm not talking Bistolite drum sets and stuff like that. And, uh, so the first thing I try to always tell people is you got to take on the bass drums is you got to take all the T rods and claws off and take the drum head off. And you also got to take off all of the, what I call the bullet points, like the spurs and the brackets, any Tom holders and any cymbal brackets, take them off. So the bass drum just has, uh, the lugs on it. And then I wrap that with uh, two layers of uh, bubble pack. Uh, and then I wrap a cardboard cylinder around the bass drum. So the bass drum like in its own cylinder. And then I put that into a larger box, you know, and then uh, and if I, if I have a floor tom or a rack tom to put inside of that, I make sure that there's no way that any of the metal parts on the floor tom can rub up it on the inside of the bass drum and scratch up either the parts or the inside of the bass drum. So, yeah. Yeah. So when people then get that drum set, they have to then assemble for safety. That's obviously the best thing. But they're putting the spurs back on. They're yeah. putting the stuff. And I mean, really, the drum sets you're selling, it's not going to little Billy for Christmas, who's right. got his first drum set. I mean, these are collectors who know how to do all that and put it back together correctly. Yeah. Most people are OK with that. I mean, they, they respect the fact that they're getting a drum set that's been properly packed and they're willing to uh, accept the fact that they're going to have to put a little bit of work into putting it back together. But also it gives them an opportunity to examine the drums more closely and also to maybe do some cleaning that they might not otherwise do. But generally, I like to send the drums ready all ready to go cleaned up, polished Yeah, from every every lug, every rim, you know, everything's cleaned up, you know. So, yeah, uh, I think it's worth it. I was selling um, for. For Gwyn Sound, the studio I work for, when when we got a new owner and it was kind of like, let's clear out a bunch of the old, you know how studios sometimes have like uh, a room full of just old outboard gear and like oh, yeah. stuff like, like um, uh, I believe it was like one of those, it was like a MIDI control, like a box where your sounds would be in this outboard gear or whatever, something like that. Yeah. Um, I was selling a bunch of stuff on Reverb and it was all going great. There was one item though, and I can't remember exactly what it was. I think it was like I said, like a like a brain for a you know keyboard or something. But 
I packed it all up really, really nicely. I put a lot of, you know, I wrapped the, just the bejesus out of everything. But <laughs> uh, I got a note from the buyer sending me a picture. This thing looks like it had fallen off the plane. Mm -hmm. They had like the, the ears, you know, the rack mount, you know, on the sides yeah. were completely bent. The metal, the thick wow. metal was completely twisted. And I'm thinking, mm -hmm. how does that even happen? Um, so of course I gave a refund. I don't think it was a super expensive piece of equipment, but, um, you got to plan for the worst. Um, so you're smart to take things apart and cause uh, drums are wood and yeah. things break. I did have an interesting situation. I had to ship a Simmons STS seven brain to France. Hmm. And I, like, like you said, I, I packed it carefully, bubble packed everything. And they must've run over it with a brick, uh, with a bulldozer or something. <laughs> Guy sent me a picture from France, and I was like, "Oh my God!" It was all twisted and smashed in, oh. and, and they, of course, they wouldn't honor. You know, the insurance. They were like, "No, we won't cover it." You know, so I had to fully refund him. I lost the money shipping there and the shipping back. This says I want it back, so I ended up selling it for parts because the parts for those things are just as valuable as the thing itself. So I was able to get a little bit of money back, but it was it was a huge loss. It's just every once in a while something will get a catastrophic you know, damage done to it by, and, and a lot of times they're not always very good about covering it, especially if you're shipping to a country. Yeah. But a lot of times they're going to be like, eh, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's so much going on that, and, mm -hmm. but actually that's really smart. And I think that's something to touch on is the, um, sometimes having a drum set and all the parts seems like, like from time to time you can make more money parting things out. Yeah. But then you're kind of, you don't want to break up a nice drum set. But like if you have a tom and like a floor tom, like orphan stuff yeah. that it is possible to or or taking off, like you said, certain elements of the hardware mm -hmm. that you can make more parting things out. Yeah, there are people that do that, you know, and I don't begrudge them because, I mean, they're trying to make a living, but they'll take basically a whole drum set and part every screw up. And, it, and I, that's something I've never adhered to. I, I've always sold whole drums or whole drum sets or snare drums. I've never parted them out because I just, I don't know. I just feel something, there's, there's something wrong with that. But that that's just me. I don't criticize anybody else oh, for yeah. doing that. You know? Yeah. I understand that everybody's out to make a buck. But what really gets me is that on eBay, you'll see, and on uh, Reverb too, where people will put up like a screw and it's not even a slingland screw. It's like a Japanese screw, and they're like twenty dollars for this screw. I'm like, what the heck? I don't get it. <laughs> no, because I guess sometimes there's like, you know, you can find the keyword of like, this is the right size for that drum, but it might not be, yeah, correct and all that stuff. Have you ever come across? Uh, I imagine for for everyone, it's like, uh, you know, the ultimate, but like, like new old stock stuff. Yeah. What yeah. what's your experience with that? Uh, I've, ha I've had a lot of experience finding new old stock drums, hardware, and electronic uh, drum equipment, you know, because I'm really big into the vintage drum, you know, the Simmons, the Tama, all that stuff, and uh, Roland and uh, Sinair and Sinex, uh, Syndrum. So whenever I find it, I might I, I get just as excited over that because I love that stuff, you know. Yeah. And uh, it's wonderful when you can find stuff like that. Uh, it doesn't just because it's new old stock in the box, though, doesn't mean it's going to be mint. A lot of times things can oxidize inside of a box. You can pull a stand out and it won't be rusted, but it'll be completely oxidized. All the chrome will be dull because it's oxidized hmm. and the, all the alloy pieces will be oxidized because they're just old. They've just been sitting there for a million years. And a lot of times they didn't wrap them with a whole lot of protective, uh, like clear plastic. They wrapped them in uh, paper yeah. and the paper doesn't do a really good job of always keeping the moisture out. You know? so. Yeah. Yeah. It's still fun though. I love finding you know new boxes. It's like ah, yeah, just the boxes I get excited over. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think everyone listening would know this, but new old stock obviously refers to like you know maybe a um, I don't know like a drum store closed and then the building no one went into the building and the back room is just full of all these parts and stuff. So that's what that and that's every industry you see like motorcycle stuff and all this mm -hmm. like the back room is just like but and then it's just neat to see like you said the old packaging and all this that that yeah. cool stuff D does that raise the value I, it has to be a little bit more valuable because it's original yeah it can raise the value especially if you have something exquisitely rare like a, a snare drum like an old Gretsch or roger snare drum is still in its original box that could really raise the value you know especially if it's got the part number on the side that's uh coherent to the part to the drum itself you know yeah so that's cool that, that is very once in a while very cool. Um, all right. So what going back a little bit to like, you know, talking about drum shows and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, 
how how do you think everything? I mean, there's a lot of drum shows now, and I mean, it's such a cool community as we as we all know. There's a drum show, and the drummer community is just great. Um, do you make it out to a lot of the drum shows still? And and what do you think is going on? How how, how do you see things now versus in you know let's say '90 when things um, 32 years ago when things were just starting out? Uh, I try to go to every drum show I can possibly get my hands on. I mean, I've even been to the West Coast for the Hollywood drum show. I try to go to anyone I can go to because I think they're all uh, relevant. And I always try to encourage anybody who plays drums to check out a drum show because I always tell them, you're going to love it. You're going to have such a great time looking at all this stuff, hearing new products. Because the drum shows also have new products as well as vintage products. And so it's a great opportunity to really test out new merchandise, you know. Yeah. And it's just a great hang, you know, because there's so many great people, you know, even with the some of the younger guys that are coming into the business now, uh, us old folks, uh, we, we like to bring them on and we, we all go out to dinner and, and shoot the crap. And, and uh, it's great. It's a great community. It's one of the nicest communities I can imagine. You know, everybody is just really gets along great. And uh, even though we're somewhat competitive, we still we're not, you know, stomping on each other's uh, stepping over each other to steal something or buy something out from underneath. So yeah. if, we, if I hear somebody's buying or interested in something, I back off. You yeah. Know? So yeah. you have a great relationship. Yeah. You don't hear many bad things. And, and I would, I think it's true that if, if someone is being dishonest or a little shifty, people hear about it. I mean, yeah. there's times where I hear about things where, you know, I'm, I'm on the podcast, more the interview side of things here in Cincinnati. And it's like, I'm hearing about a guy who's doing some shifty stuff. Like, in England on eBay. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, how do, yeah. how, how is this getting to me? So word travels, um, it does. your, your reputation is important and seems like the only way to really grow your reputation is to just be there and do it and be honest. Yeah. It's like each sale sort of builds up your reputation, um, one stone at a time. And, and I'm sure there is gotta be some competition like you and like Steve Maxwell and these guys and Don Bennett, these guys who were like dealing with mm. high level drum sets. Yeah. Are, are sort of um, going after the same people, but but I'm sure you guys are all very respectful and, and there's enough meat on the bone for everyone. Yeah, yeah. And I, I'm very fortunate because I have a, a clientele that, that I deal with that they're pretty uh, reliable and, and I, I, do, I still do a lot of business with them on a regular basis. And um, we all, I don't really have to go looking for it. I don't have to call them up and say, hey, I'm looking for this or are you looking to buy this drum or yeah. It's very it's very laid back. There's yeah. not a whole lot of push or competition because of that. Yeah. I mean, um I don't know. It's it's such it's such a cool thing though. And there's a lot of uh there's a lot of collectors. It seems like there's a lot of um people who have the means to buy these drum sets and cool. um and and keep them safe, which that's the best thing too, is these drums aren't going to um, you know, the dump or anything like that. Cause I'm sure then historically there's been times where some guy is just like clearing out an attic mm. and has thrown away like mm. you know a black beauty or something like that yeah. like yeah we, we've all heard stories about how we just missed out where you go to a house or see somebody and they oh yeah my neighbor just threw out this funky old drum set i'm like no you hear about that all the time the most biggest one i've ever heard of is when ludwig was closing down their flat their plant in chicago and rather than move all this inventory down to South Carolina, where they're based now, they just threw it all away. And there were literally dumpsters full of new old stock Ludwig parts that I would, I would have bought every bit of it. But they, they just took all that stuff and threw it all away. Drums, parts, set, drum heads. Oh, it just breaks your heart. You know? Wow. Mm-hmm. I mean, I guess it's because the logistical nightmare of like parting it out and yeah. selling it and taking the pictures and uh well then i guess there wouldn't be an ebay you know there's no internet then but um yeah. uh, i guess it's just easier to just destroy it <laughs> yeah yeah so it's very different because like when rogers uh, was in the process of dismantling the business who cbs uh cbs instruments owned rogers uh they they basically put it out there and they sold a lot of that stuff to different dealers around the country uh, my good friend dave drew over at al drew's music bought a huge amount of inventory from Rogers and had it shipped over to his warehouse in the uh, Woonsocket, Rhode Island. And uh, so Rogers was really cool about that. Slingland, when they got, when they got bought out, uh, Gretsch bought them out. So a lot of Slingland inventory went down to the Gretsch uh, factory. And I guess they're in South Carolina also. Hmm. So we're very fortunate they did that because Ludwig, like I said, they just, they just tossed all that stuff out. 
Yeah, and guys like uh, Bernie Stone, who has he bought he was on the show and he he bought the old radio frequency um, yeah. stuff, which that was a cool one. I get a lot of comments on Bernie's episode. People liked how he figured out the uh, mathematical equations to make this equipment work. But um, I've been there, yeah, he went through a lot of trouble to get that stuff back up and running. You know, yeah, you know, an interesting story about the Slingland factory is that Buddy Carlos, who's probably one of the bigger collectors out there for many years. Uh, he was uh, for a very short time. He was endorsing Slingland drums for like a year, and he was playing a black drum set with copper hardware. Well, they called him up and said, "Hey, we're closing down the factory. If you want to come by and help yourself to anything you want." So he went down there and just kind of scooped up a bunch of bits and pieces, and uh, a lot of it was his copper plated parts, you know. And it's funny how they did. Different companies handle things differently, you know. They were willing to let people come in. Slingland was let, willing to let people come into their. They had a Chicago plant and just outside of Chicago in Niles, Illinois. And they let people come in there and just grab stuff. Whereas wow. Ludwig, they just threw it all away. <laughs> Jeez. Um, mm. Man, if, you know, it is what it is. You can't yeah. change change it. But, well, Richard, this has just been awesome. So um, I am going to be at the uh, Covington um, Rogers drum show that Poe Shy puts on. I think I'm going to have a booth with... Um, with Vincent Ward, uh, who is at Junk Rock Drums and Vitalizer Drums. And basically, I just, I don't really have anything to like put on. I have a little sign and some business cards. But so I'll be there um, uh, with Vincent because he's got things to actually sell. But mm-hmm. then I'll be at, uh, I think I'm going to have to miss Chicago this year because my wife oh. is having a baby two weeks before. Oh. And um, I'd like to not get my head ripped off by asking <laughs> to even, uh, by bringing that yeah. up to go to a drum <laughs> <laughs> drum show two weeks later. But right. um, I plan on being at the uh, Music City Drum Show in Nashville in July Okay. Um, for everyone listening. And then um, I will probably be at PASIC in November. And uh, I've never been to NAM. I'd like to go to NAM in uh, oh, January. Um, it's a blast. So are you, which, which shows are you going to be at this year? And so maybe people can come up and say hi to you. And uh, I'll definitely be in Chicago. I don't usually get a booth. I just kind of wander around aimlessly, but uh, yeah. I'll be in Chicago all, all three days, the dealer load in day and then the two actual show days. I'm hoping to go to the music expo down in Nashville as well. I, I, don't, I am not going to go to the Rogers thing because I have a gig that weekend. Otherwise yeah. I'd be, lo- I'd love to come down there because I'm, I'm good friends with Jeff Burke and, yeah. and Poe Shy. They're really, really nice people. Yep. And they always put on a great show. Love to go to that. And Vincent's a good friend of mine also. He lives right here. In yeah, Maryland that's right. As well. Yeah. yeah. He's, he's been over here. He can tell you stories. Yep. <laughs> yep. Vincent's awesome. We've kind of become, I mean, we're like co, uh, just, uh, we're kind of around the same age and he's really helped yeah. me out a lot with, I, I kind of bounce ideas off of him and, and, and doing the whole Patreon bonus thing, which we'll do in a little bit and talk about that was, t- that was Vincent's idea. Um, and it's worked out great, but, um, so, um, Richard, as we wrap up here, I think we're going to do a Patreon bonus episode here for a couple minutes. And what I'd like to maybe talk about is, um, I don't know. I think a a lot of folks who listen to the show are, they either work at drum stores, they, they uh, buy and sell drums. So maybe you could, we could pick your brain um, when we do it and get like tips that you found on eBay for some keywords that you like to use or things like, you know, photography and, and, and things that you've, you've learned over it to get some tips on how to, how to sell drums. You don't have to give away your industry, your, <laughs> your secrets, but um, maybe we do a start to finish. Like you acquire it, you shoot it, you itemize it, all that stuff. Does that sound good? Sure. Cool. Well, uh, if people want to hear that, they can go to drumhistorypodcast.com and click the Patreon link and follow and join up and get cool perks like that. Um, Richard, why don't you take this time now here to kind of tell people where they can find you if they want to reach out and um, maybe get some hardware or deal with you with buying and selling drums or anything like that. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, my name is King's music on, uh, on eBay. I've been there for, well, since 20, 2000, 2002, I'm sorry. Uh, on Facebook, you can just find me as Richard King. I think that's about it. I don't really have a website anymore. I got rid of all that stuff, uh, yeah. but you can always contact me. It's, Facebook's the best way to do that. Sure. You know, Cause um, see people seem to find that much easier. Yeah. That's the way it's worked, I think, because that's how I fit connected with you is, I don't yeah. know, websites are a lot. I have one for the podcast, obviously, but websites are a lot to um, handle, especially if you're on eBay and all that stuff. Yeah. So, um, well, Richard, this has been awesome. So I do want to, before we wrap up, I want to thank um, Anthony Amadeo for uh, suggesting you for this. Thank you, Anthony. He's a great guy. I love Anthony. Yep. 
and uh, and um, obviously Lewis Bernstein, who kind of put your put your name in my in my ear uh, to begin with with his episode, which uh, was a really fun one. So <laughs> this is awesome, Richard. Thank you for being on the podcast. Thank you, thank you, Bart. It's a pleasure to be here. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning.